six days. <laughs> I, I used to have one of those real jobs. Uh, yeah, so I spent a lot of time flying around the country talking to big agrochemical companies like DuPont and Syngenta. And I would deliver marketing strategies and talk to them about how they could really better build trust and transparency with their customer base. And it was one of those live anywhere types of jobs. So when I needed a change in scenery, I put my dogs, my record player, and I, in my Subaru, and I moved out to the only region in the country I had not yet lived, the Pacific Northwest, Portland, Oregon. And no, no, naturally, you know, when I got here, someone was like, hey, you want to go check out a farm? I was like, uh, sure do, yeah, sure. Um, so we get there and we start touring the vegetables. And uh, one of the farmers, he reaches down and he snaps off a stalk of celery. He goes, you want to try the celery? I, n n celery? <laughs> I was like, the most boring vegetable ever and it only tastes like anything when you put peanut butter in it and raisins along it. Uh, no, I, and then my first thought was, you know, is this safe? Are his hands clean? We were just looking at the sheep. I, uh, <laughs> but then I was like, all right, be cool, be cool. This is how people eat in Portland. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna try that celery. So I bite into this celery and you know, you know this moment when you tilt your head back, you eat something so good, and you close your eyes, and the whole world melts away. It's just me and you, Celery. It's just me and you. Now, this feeling of bliss was uh, immediately interrupted by another feeling. I've been robbed. We've all been robbed. I've never had Celery before in my life. So, I quit my job, and I became a farmer. And it wasn't long before I found out that farming's actually pretty hard. Yeah. Not something you can just do when you're from Detroit. Um, anyway, so, well, let me, let's just go back a minute, sorry. Actually, farming is pretty much the most impossible way you could ever choose to make a living. And I didn't really want to accept this. How could it really be this hard to make an honest living growing food? That's that one thing every human being on this earth needs. And I really wanted to understand what's going on. So I got in my Subaru and I started driving around to my neighbor's farms. And I ended up sitting down with 250 farmers, chefs, butchers, bakers, and food advocates here in the Portland area, because I wanted to understand what's going on. And here's what I learned. This wasn't my problem. This is our problem. And this is the problem of the root, if you will, of all the problems we've talked about today. 85% of our farmers right now are over 65 years old. And nobody wants to take over their farming operations. Why? Well, you'd have to be a crazy person to spend all this money on college and quit your six-figure year salary and take a job that offers no health insurance with no view of retirement and only guarantees that you're going to work your ass off every day for the rest of your life. Listen, when I was growing up, I wasn't like, hey, mom, one day I want to get married and I want to buy a slaughterhouse. <laughs> I did not say that, no. But I do. And yes, I get to wear gold hoops still. And I did it because someone has to. Because 90% of the farms in America right now are facing extinction. And these are the kind of farmers that we want to buy our food from. These are the kind of farmers who care about their soil who care about their land, who care about their communities, and their entire way of life is facing extinction. For all of us here today, what that means is pretty simple. No more local food, no more farmer's markets, no more CSAs. And I don't want to live in a world 
where my only option is to buy meat and produce from a big corporation. I don't want to do it. Sounds like you don't either. Because we invented a system where only 10% of every dollar you spend on food goes back to the producer. The rest is spent in the middle on processing, packaging, transportation, and reselling. And as a result, we're also experiencing only 10% of the flavor, the freshness, and the nutrients. Because we invented a supply chain that's really, really good at processing cheap food and selling uniform waxed apples at the same place we go to buy our toilet paper. And as humans, as survivors, we have always invented systems designed to meet the needs of our time. As cavemen, we created fire. Then we domesticated animals. In our next food system, we hybridized vegetables for storability and shelf life. Then we invented chemicals to put on our fields. Sounded like a good idea at the time. And fast forward a few decades, and we have inherited the industrial food system. This is the one we know, right? And it was designed to make food quick, convenient, and cheap. We did a great job. We're in that area, era where it became really easy to eat your feelings. My mom's answer to everything was a sandwich. A classic white bread, peanut butter, and jelly sandwich ready in a jiff before you could even start crying. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> and now, now we're facing the logical consequences of the choice we made to prioritize efficiency and scale. We focus so much on producing that we lost sight of the producer. And I'm here because it's about damn time we start paying our producers. And somewhere in this long straight line that we designed, our celery no longer tastes like celery. But right now, today, we are all active participants in building what will be our next food system. And these are simply the issues that we will need to design our systems to solve. Here's an idea. Let's use technology to build a localized food system, one that directly connects farmers to the people who want to buy from them. This is how we give our farmers more than 10%. And this is how we make it possible for them to make a living. I want to make it as easy to buy from our local farmers as it is to book a stay in someone's house or call a ride. Because if it was easier to buy better tasting, fresher food directly from your local farmer than it was to go to a supermarket after a long day, wouldn't you? Perfect. We're in good shape. Because as it turns out, we know how to do this. We've done it before. That's right. Hey, Jeff Bezos, you have nothing on the milkman. And today, right now, we have the technology, we have the resources available to us to effectively scale that original distribution model. Because true innovation isn't about inventing more at all. True innovation is about reimagining. It's about taking the very best of what has always worked in our systems and applying the resources that we have available to us today to make them better, to make them better for people and the communities that need them. One day, sitting down with a fifth generation farmer, his family has been raising pork for 125 years, only 20 miles from here. And he's been supplying some of Portland's best restaurants long before anybody asked their server, where does bacon come from? <laughs> and he's saying that he can no longer afford to raise animals. More importantly, he can't take the time 
to drive them in and out of the city every week. So I said, I'll do it. And I rented his extended Econoline refrigerated diesel van so that I could deliver his pork to restaurants, and I started picking up goods from other farmers in his position. And one day, after a long day of deliveries, I was pulling back into the shop, and he was sitting there. Just take a second to say he was sitting, which was great for him. And he's sitting there, and he looks at me, and he gets one of those, I'm going to look you in the eye as I walk towards you kind of vibes. And I'm like, oh, what I do? Hey, yeah. And he puts out his hand, and he gives me one of those farmer firm handshakes, and he says, thank you. All I've ever wanted was for our pork to be in people's homes. And now that's possible. Because so much of everything today feels hard. So many things seem insurmountable to do. But this, this is our food and our connection to it. It isn't that hard. It is as simple as gathering together with our families in the kitchen to cook. It's valuing the perfect piece of toast and the feeling that you get when you crack an Easter blue egg with a bright yellow yolk into a hot pan. The satisfaction of eating tomatoes off of a vine we planted in our backyard. Being willing to buy something other than bananas at the supermarket. Shaking hands with Jimmy, the butcher. And waiting all year for the sweetness of strawberries in June. <laughs> strawberries. Food is offering us an opportunity, an opportunity to come together, to stand on common ground, to put our hands in common soil so that we can rebuild this future in a way that rebalances what we need with what we value. Let this be the era when we reclaim our connection to the land, to the people, and to the places that feed us. Because we can do this, each of us, in our own way. And still at the end of this, if you're saying, I still don't quite understand, and I'm not sure what I can do about it, I want you to call me. I'm going to bring you some celery. <laughs> Thank you.